Yes, it's wet, yes, it's windy, and it's blooming cold too. But do you know what? The days are already starting to get longer, and I am positively luxuriating in the extra 10 minutes of day length we already have on the darkest day of the year. I will take what I can get. Make the most of precious daylight by cracking on with my top jobs for the month, including some clever ideas to put yourself in pole position for the coming growing season. Let's jump straight in by coaxing along an extra early harvest of this wonderfully warming winner, rhubarb. You can see a few of the pleasingly plump buds down here, and we can encourage these into early growth by covering them over to exclude light in a process called forcing. And it's called forcing because we're just forcing plants into early growth. I've cleared away all the old uh, leaves and the odd weed that was here, and there's this lovely blanket of well-rotted garden compost, which should help feed the plant as it stirs into life. Now you can buy special rhubarb forces, which look really rather stunning. Alas, I don't have such gardening bling, so I'm just gonna opt for a black container like this with no holes in that should fully exclude the light. And then to help trap warmth and speed things along, I'm gonna cover the outside of our container with this bubble plastic here. You could use, for example, straw secured in place somehow. And then just obviously, whatever you're applying, do tie it securely into place so it doesn't blow away. This will keep things nice and cozy. Now it's just a question of waiting for those lovely elongated pale stems to come along, which depending on the progress of your winter should happen within about two months. Now you'll find these stems are much more tender and even sweeter than traditionally harvested rhubarb stems. Just the job for a warming crumble. Please only force well-established rhubarb crowns, which will have the energy behind them to cope with this kind of treatment. And I would suggest only doing this once every few years to give the plant a chance to recover between being forced. I would say that's a good reason to grow more than one plant of rhubarb. Potatoes, is there a more versatile vegetable, I ask you? Of course there isn't. Whether you rave about roasties, go mad for mash or fancy your fries, there's a spud for that. Get on and order them now while there's still plenty of choice. I like to grow a mix of both early season and main crop potatoes, which gives me the best of both worlds. Lovely fresh new potatoes for salads and then chunky spuds for storing well into winter. Now when you're choosing your potatoes, be sure to read the variety description very carefully to check it not only matches what you're after, but also displays attributes such as scab resistance or resistance to blight. Once you get hold of your seed potatoes, get them out of their packaging, and we're going to place them somewhere bright but frost-free to chit, which just means to produce little sprouts. Now you want short, sturdy sprouts like these. That will get your potatoes off to a really flying start, those spring-planted potatoes. Now you can pop them into anything that helps to keep them upright and you want the end with the most little eyes, that's these kind of little dimples here, facing upwards. Seed potatoes only need to be chitted about six weeks ahead of planting, so you may find delaying chitting them until next month is actually preferable. And don't forget, if you haven't got a frost-free greenhouse, I don't, then they will happily chit on a bright windowsill indoors. Planning makes perfect, or something like that. Do you know what you will be growing next season? When it comes to planning, there are lots of things to consider. Crop rotation, so the same crop families aren't in the same piece of ground season after season. Sunshine requirements, prioritizing the sunniest spots for the warm season crops. And of course, making the most of the space you have by mapping out when crops will be in the ground and when and where spaces will appear as the growing season progresses so you can make the most of every square inch of ground. Planning your garden is every bit as important as say menu planning or financial planning. And by doing so, you can up your chances of an embarrassment of riches. Now, if you're not sure where to start, please do check out last week's video on garden planning, which I will link to down below. It's amazing how fast time can fly, so ditch the dawdling and finish prepping growing areas before it's too late. 
Now is a great time to start up new growing areas, assuming you're not under feet of snow, of course, in which case, wait a few weeks till you're not. Now the beds around me here were started a few winters ago. I simply dug the raised beds into the slope to give a level surface and then lined both the beds and the surrounding paths with cardboard to suppress and eventually kill off the lawn and weeds beneath. The paths then got a topping of wood chips while the beds were filled with rougher organic material and then finished off with lovely well-rotted compost. Now of course you don't need to grow in raised beds, you can just grow in beds in the ground or if your garden is on a gentle slope you might like to consider terracing your growing areas. Whatever you do get on and get these beds ready now so things have a chance to settle down ready for sowing and planting in a few months. The acidity or alkalinity of our soil, its pH, plays a big part in the success of what we can grow. Now most vegetables like it neutral to ever so slightly acidic, but there's one family of plants that really can't abide it too acidic. Brassicas, that's cabbage family plants that include the likes of kale, broccoli, cauliflower and so on. They really can't abide it too acidic and they need a pH of really six and a half or above to mildly alkaline. Now they will grow in more acidic soils but they really won't thrive and will be more open to diseases like say club root. If you're going to plant pH picky plants then it's worth doing a pH test beforehand and adjusting your soil to suit. If your soil is very acidic then you can raise the pH or make it more alkaline by simply sprinkling on garden lime or ground limestone which is basically just calcium carbonate, kind of like taking an indigestion tablet for an acid burned tummy. Now weigh out what you need for the area and put it in a container and then sprinkle it on a nice still day and then rake it all in. And actually wood ash, and I mean good pure wood ash without any impurities, is also slightly alkaline so it's something else you could use to raise your soil's pH. Getting this all in place now will give it a few months to work its way into the soil ready for planting time. Will it snow or won't it snow? I hope so, I love tobogganing and it brings out the inner child of me. And while snow does keep us away from the garden, it's not all bad. It helps insulate plants from the worst of the cold and it gives us a chance to rest up before the growing season. Our plans are quite literally put on ice. But snow is heavy. Shake off heavy snow from snap prone trees and shrubs or to stop it pushing down and splaying apart bushes. Some greenhouses or cold frames and even tunnels may be at risk of very heavy snow so just carefully brush or scrape it off to stop it collapsing any structures. And if you do have lots and lots of snow then avoid piling it on top of vulnerable plants that might be buried for weeks on end. Getting ready for the new growing season also means cleaning and sharpening your tools, including your always at your side pruners or secateurs. Where would we be without them, hey? Now these guys are in a pretty sorry state, so let's try and bring them back to life. Bring them back into shape by loosening and then sort of scrubbing off any ingrained sap or rust in this case. And you can do that with a kind of scouring pad or wire wool, something like that. Sometimes you might find that kind of really ingrained sap comes off a bit easier with a little squirt of oil just to loosen it off first. Then once you're done, just give it a good kind of wipe clean like that and then just kind of leave it open like this for it to completely dry before we move on to our next part. Now if you've got removable parts like this, you can actually completely dismantle your, uh, your pruners and then kind of work on them like that for a more thorough job, but I think we've done all right with this. And now to sharpen the cutting blade only using this whetstone here I've had soaking in the water, and I'm gonna pass it at the same angle as the cutting blade moving it away from me to get us our nice sharp angle back. And then to finish it off, just flip it over to the flat side and just run it along the back like that to remove any burrs. Now, if it's very loose, you can then 
get your old screwdriver or whatever and tighten up any loose parts. This isn't too bad, but what it is missing is the old spring in the middle here. So I'm gonna order myself a new part and drop that in. Meanwhile, I'm just gonna give the central moving parts here a little bit of an oil just to kind of keep them nice and loose. There we are, job done. And these are looking so much better and a lot sharper too. And look, much freer moving too. Job done. And what better way to put our good as new pruners to use than a spot of fruit pruning, specifically bushes such as currants and gooseberries. Now when pruning any of these fruits, we want to cut out the three Ds. That's branches that are obviously dead, badly diseased or badly damaged. Plus any branches that are crossing other branches or just generally getting in the way. We want to encourage a good open branch work and that will encourage good airflow and ensure there are fewer diseases and that fruits ripen a little better. The black currants in this bed are three years old now and a few are due a very light prune. Now a great way to encourage fresh, vigorous and crucially productive growth is to prune out up to one third of the older stems and you can usually tell which are oldest by the darker colour of them. Now this is still pretty young and healthy, but it's rubbing here. So I'm gonna take out this stem here, just to kind of keep it open like that. There we go. And taking it right down to the ground, and then this will encourage more shoots to push up from down below to keep everything really kind of keen and healthy. And here are my somewhat overcrowded gooseberry bushes. Now the first job is to remove these low hanging, sagging branches so they're not touching the ground. When these guys are overloaded with fruit, they kind of drag down and it'll just keep everything neat and tidy. Some of these incidentally are producing a few roots, so I might cut these up and uh, pop them up to propagate them. And now I'm just gonna cut away a few of the central branches just to kind of open it out a bit. There, I think that looks much better, doesn't it Rosie? Do you have a gaping hole in your greenhouse like this? Or is your cold frame ooh, a bit like this? Or maybe you have uh, damaged walls, broken fences or poorly fitting gates. Get on and fix them now while you still have time. Tighten up screws, replace broken windows, and get everything in good shape and functional once again. Now repairs made in winter will stand you in good stead for spring, so you can make the most of all of these invaluable gardening assets. If you didn't get a chance to sow hardy peas or fava or broad beans earlier in the autumn, later this month is another opportunity to do so. Now sowing these uh, vegetable garden favourites is always a little bit of a gamble in the autumn. If you get a really mild spell, they can grow kind of tall and gangly like this. These are the result of a very mild end to the autumn. Now this is fine, but any really, really hard frost, they're probably likely to go blackened and kind of languish and then fail. So now is a good chance to sow again. Sow beans into large size plug trays and peas can go into plug trays as well, or you can sow them into lengths of guttering like this. Now these guys have been soaking overnight to give them a bit of a head start, and we'll be looking at more ways of priming your seeds in a, a later video. So I'm just gonna pop them over the surface of the potting mix here, not too precisely, but trying to aim for about one to two inches or sort of three to five centimeters apart. And then once these are covered over, they'll grow on in here. And then I will plant them out simply by sliding them out of here from one end into a waiting trench, nice and easy. If you'd like more ideas of what to be sowing now, and believe it or not, there is a surprising amount to be sowing, then do pop on over to this video next. Happy gardening, and I'll catch you next time.